Everybody, thank you so much for joining our webinar. Everybody should have a good week. There was very sad news today, and that, of course, is that Chief Rabbi Jonathan Sachs passed away. And I see also now that uh, Rabbi David Feinstein, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein's son, also passed away today, if my, inf inf if my information is correct. But um, why I say that is because telling a story on Matzah Shabbos is of paramount importance. It brings bracha to the world, and right now, the world needs bracha. There's a, there's a pandemic that's sweeping across the globe. There's sadness, and we've got to transform that. And learning Torah and hearing stories of Rebbeim on Matzah Shabbos and Saturday night makes these things go viral. It makes godliness go viral. And nobody better to do this than our dear friend Rabbi Alex Karlebach, who I think is the, the best, one of the best sheer givers in the country and one of the best storytellers in, in the world, actually. And his, his knowledge of history is so amazing. So without sounding patronizing, Rabbi Karlebach, thank you for doing this every week. And please, God, discuss the story here tonight, honoring the Rebbe Rishab of Ziyamiletis, whose birthday was today. May we have the revelation of Mashiach absolutely immediately now. Amen. Shkaya Harav Mesinta for that uh, beautiful introduction. And as you say, today, Chof Cheshvin, we also got the, the uh, tragic news that Chief Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs passed away today. He was very close to Chabad. He had a lot of instruction from the Rebbe. In fact, the Rebbe encouraged him to become a rabbi. So we would like to dedicate tonight's Shia to uh, Chief Rabbi Jonathan Sachs and all that he has accomplished in his lifetime and truly beyond. Last week, we began discussing the fifth Lubavitch Rebbe, the Rebbe Rashab, and today is actually his birthday in 1860. That was known as Kisra. The Rebbe Marash called it Kisra. Kisra in Aramaic means a crown. And he said he is going to be the crown. And uh, he passed away on the 2nd of Nisan, 1920, which, in fact, is 100 years ago on the 2nd of Nisan, uh, 12 days before Pesach, was his 100th yard site. And as mentioned last week, uh, I, being born in 1954, grew up in Montreal, and uh, went to New York in 1970, I had the great privilege of meeting many Hasidim who were very close to the Rebbe Rashab. And as I'll conclude tonight, one of them was uh, Rabbi Chitrik, who was a, a um, student in Tom Chet Mimim and a Hasid of the Rebbe Rashab. And the story I'll conclude with is one of his Hasidim Rableza Nanis. Now, the Rebbe Rashab was called Rab Sholem Dave Bear, and he was given that name by his grandfather, the Tzemach Tzedek. And the Tzemach Tzedek named him after two personalities. The Tzemach Tzedek was his, um, his father's name was Sholem, and his father-in-law, and uncle, the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe was Du Bear, so he called him Sholem Dov Bear. One of the most famous stories of the Rebbe Rashab that the Rebbe used to often tell took place when the Rebbe Rashab was four or five years old. And every year on his birthday, he would go to his grandfather, he would go to his grandfather more often only than on his birthday. He spent, in fact, a lot of time with his grandfather, but he also uh, went on his birthday, as I say, in four or five. And that Shabbos was portion of Vayera. And when he came to the Rebbe, he began crying. The Rebbe comforted him and he asked him, why are you crying? And he said he had learned 
in the Torah portion of Vayera that God appeared to Avraham. And his cry was, why did God appear to Avraham and he doesn't appear to him, the boy Shalom Bear? And the Rebbe points out about that, what Hasidic education is all about. What does it mean when a child cries? It means that he knows he is missing something. For example, if someone takes away his toy, he starts crying because something that he wants was taken from him. When you take a child shopping and he's in the shopping cart and he sees all the sweets on display, he cries because he wants them. He is missing something. That's what a cry is all about. And can you imagine the education that a four or five-year-old boy should be crying and why should he cry? He felt that he is missing, that God didn't appear to him like he appeared to our first patriarch, our first Jew, Avram Avinu. And the Tzemach Tzedek, the Rebbe answered that when a Jew is 99 years old and he dedicated his life to serving God and at 99 he decides that he has to be circumcised, which means he goes into a total new and different approach in the servants of God, he is truly worthy that God should appear to him. And as, as I say, the Rebbe often used to speak and explain that story. The Rebbe, we know, was a person who worked on himself, the Rebbe Rashab worked on himself tremendously. From a young age, the previous Rebbe writes, he became what is called a Shulchan Aruch Yid. Every single thought, every single practice and action was done according to the Shulchan Aruch. And he trained his body totally that everything would be done according to Shulchan Aruch to the extent that he uplifted himself and he felt within himself that he was so connected to the Shulchan Aruch that if his body didn't want to do something, even if he didn't understand why, that was contrary to what it should be and, and he would listen to it. He was totally tuned in. A beautiful story told about that is Lubavitch was a little shtetl. And during the Rebbe Rashab's lifetime, they brought the trains into it. And the previous Rebbe often would describe how they would hire a coach to take them from Lubavitch to Rudnia. Rudnia was the closest train station city to Lubavitch. And from there, the Rebbe would take the train. Sometimes the previous Rebbe would accompany him. Other times he, he would go on his own many times for health reasons. So the story is told that one day the Rebbe Rashab came to this train station of Rudnia. Obviously he knew all the schedules and when the trains would be going. A train was in the station. The station master who knew the Rebbe quite well because he was there quite often, saw the Rebbe in the station and the train was about to leave and the Rebbe didn't go. So the station master said to him, do you want me to hold the train? He said, no, I'm waiting for the next train. So he gave the toot toot and the train went off. A while later, a telegraph came to that station and it announced that the train who had left had been in a very serious accident, accident and many people were injured and possibly killed. The station master had witnessed this whole thing and he was quite 
upset and hurt that so many people had passed away. He came to the Rebbe and he said, Rebbe, you sensed, you knew that something was wrong because you came in time to catch that train. And yet when I asked you if you want to go on it, you answered no. And look what happened. You must have sensed that there would be something that terrible that happened to that train. And the Rebbe said, believe me, I was not aware that that train would be in an accident. But my body is so attuned to what is right and wrong that I listened to it. And when I walk towards my, the train, my feet had difficulty in walking. They didn't want to go. So I sensed there was something wrong and therefore I didn't go. But what should I tell you? That I sense my feet don't want to go. And so I didn't go on. Perhaps it is similar to what we read in um, recently that Avram Avinu, Avram Avinu, when he was called um, Avraham from Avraham, the letter He was added. That is the five limbs that are involuntary that were added to his name. Uh, I remember also reading that one time the Rebbe Rashab washed his hands and he washed as Hasidim do three on each hand instead of the customary two. And when they asked him why he does it, he said, if I do it, it says it somewhere. Talking about washing his hands, I'd like to tell you another interesting story that I read about the Rebbe Rashab. He was eating breakfast one morning and he had members of his family who had joined him at that time and one came in all excited. And the Rebbe Rashab at, the mo at that time was washing his hands for bread for the meal. And this guy was all excited. He said, did you hear what I read in the newspapers? The doctors had just discovered that there's a certain bone with vapor in the head that helps the person reflect on what he has to. And if he wants to think of something deep, he bends his head down and puts it like in his hand as the famous sculptor of the thinker. And if he wants to remember something, he lifts up his head. That is a natural reaction. And why is that? Because there's a certain bone in the skull that when you lower your head, it helps you think. And when you raise your head, it helps you remember. The Rebbe Rashab, as I said, was washing his hands and he signaled him, don't get so overly um, emotional about such a thing. And afterwards, the Rebbe Rashab brought a book of Hasidis from the Mittler Rebbe, from the second Lubavitcher Rebbe. And there in the Mimer is written about that bone in the brain. The, and it describes it exactly as the doctors did. And so he showed them that the second Lubavitcher Rebbe had written about this many decades before the doctors had even discovered it. And he said, don't think that my great grandfather, the Mittler Rebbe was a known doctor that knew the biology of a person so well. It's just that he realized what it's like in the supernal world, so to say, in the image of God Almighty, and that since the person was created in God's image, he knew that if such a existence is there in the supernal realm, it has to be 
in the physical realm as well. The Rebbe Rashab was the master, master educator of, as we mentioned last week, and we'll discuss at more length, he established the first Tom Mimim Yeshiva. So he was an educator of, of thousands of Hasidim and more. He started with the youth, but especially he was a master educator of his son, the who would later become his only son, who would later become the previous Rebbe. And the previous Rebbe has thousands of hours and, and writings about his father. And one of the stories he tells about his father and him was when the previous Rebbe was just a little boy and it was a hot summer's day. And he was sitting in his yard, wherever it was. And next to him was his friend and his mother, the previous Rebbe's mother, Rebbe Tzinshterna Sora, brought him a refreshing, beautiful piece of watermelon. And the previous Rebbe has this piece of watermelon in his hand. He is eyeing the watermelon and eyeing his friend who didn't have any and was also hot. So he was debating with himself what to do. Does he share the watermelon with his friend, which he knows is the right thing to do? Or whether does he eat the whole thing because, you know, it's enjoyable. And finally, it worn out. And he shared the piece of watermelon with his friend. Afterwards, the Rebbe Rashab, the fifth Rebbe, called in his son. And he said, I was observing you from the window. And I saw what happened, how your mother brought you this watermelon, and you were debating whether to share it. And I was not impressed. A boy like you should know and in, have ingrained within him, Avas Yisrael, the love of a fellow Jew. And the love of a fellow Jew should have made you share it immediately without the debate. And basically, he told his son where his priority should be to such a degree that the previous Rebbe as a little boy got ekelbik, became like a little sick from it all, and he threw up the watermelon out of sickness from what his father had told him. His mother came in and saw that and said, what do you want from him? He's just a little boy. And the Rebbe Rashab said, but he has to learn and he has to know, and it has to be ingrained into him. And the, Rebbe, the previous Rebbe writes from that moment on, the concept of loving your fellow Jew as yourself and putting the other one first certainly became ingrained within him. And, it, and he got that lesson. And he writes that his father was not a reactionary but his father was an actionary. He had in mind all that which he wanted to teach his son. And he chose the opportune moments in order to, to teach it to him and, and to tell him what it was he wanted. So he chose the suitable moment that it would become more ingrained within him. And there are many similar stories. The Rebbe also writes, the previous Rebbe, that in um, 1896, that is when the previous Rebbe was um, 16, he would walk with his father in, in the, uh, like the woods outside of Lubavitch, and it was a nice, beautiful summer day. 
And the Rebbe told him, look at godliness. Every grain here that is growing is in God's holy thoughts. And this divine providence is creating each grain with a certain purpose. The previous Rebbe writes, as we were walking in the woods, and I was listening intently about Hashkocha Protis, the whole concept of divine providence, I um, picked off, as some people do, a leaf from a tree. And in my thoughts, I began rolling that leaf in my fingers, just to help me think. And the Rebbe Rashab turned to me, the, the previous Rebbe writes, and he said, the Holy Arizal said that every leaf of a tree is a creation with a divine spark. And God created this divine spark for a purpose that has to do with the whole creation. And so in every leaf, there's a spark of a soul that comes down. And a person is always responsible for his actions. And a person, how does it happen that a, a leaf which was created with a certain purpose and has a godly purpose and you take it off and just destroy it. What makes the eye of that leaf smaller than the eye of you? Certainly, the eye of the leaf is just a plant and you are a, a human being. And there is a big difference between the two. Nevertheless, you must remember that there's godliness in every single thing. And we shouldn't just destroy leaves. This was the type of, of educator that the Rebbe Rashab was. The Rebbe Rashab physically was not the, uh, in the most healthy of, of, of people. But nevertheless, despite his poor health, he managed to accomplish in, in ways that we will never understand. As I mentioned last week, his father, the Rebbe Marash, passed away when he was 21. And although he began saying public discourses immediately and in certain ways helping people, Ah. Nevertheless, he didn't accept the leadership, the official leadership for 11 years till after his brother, the Raza, left. At one of those times, I'm not sure exactly in which year, but I heard this story from the Rebbe at a Fabrengen. A Jew came in to the Rebbe Rashab in Yechidis and he needed a blessing for a certain item, certain relevant thing in his life. And the Rebbe Rashab listened to his problem and he said, I'm sorry, I cannot help you. There's nothing I can do for you. The man brokenhearted left the Rebbe's room and in the corridor in front of the Rebbe's room, he was crying bitterly. And the Rebbe's older brother, the Raza, came past at that time, Rab Zalman Aaron, and he saw this man crying so bitterly, he asked him what's wrong. And he told him what had happened uh, in his audience with the Rebbe Rashab. So the Raza went into the Rebbe Rashab and said, this is not the way. You are a Rebbe. You have to do everything in your power to help him. You can't just refuse helping him. So the Rebbe Rashab said, fine, send him back in. And the Rebbe Rashab put on his gartel. The man came back in. 
the Rebbe Rashab gave him a beautiful blessing, which was later fulfilled, and he was helped from all his problems. And the Rebbe asked about that. What is going on here? The Rebbe Rashab obviously wasn't playing games. If he could help him, why didn't he help him to begin with? Why did he first refuse to help him and only then help him? And his answer was that for a Rebbe to help someone, we have to make ourselves a vessel. A, a bracha, a blessing, even of a tzaddik, has to rest on something that is a worthy vessel. And when this man came into the Rebbe Rashab, the Rebbe Rashab saw that he was not yet a worthy vessel. And so when he refused to help him and the person walked out of the room and became so broken within to the degree that he was crying and he uplifted himself, that's when he made himself a, a, um, a, a proper vessel and he was able to help him in, in a most wonderful, wonderful way. Do you know, the Rebbe Rashab traveled a lot. And in one of his fabrengens, in one of his talks, he talks a lot about being able to picture something in your mind and how picturing it in your mind has an effect. And he was quite, if you want to call it, a worldly person as well. And the Rebbe Rashab says that when he traveled outside Russia, he used to travel to many sophisticated countries too, like Italy, France, Germany, uh, sometimes for health reasons, but also to help Jews, and he would meet Jews at all those times. He says he went to museums, art museums, and he saw some amazing paintings of a famous artist by the name of Raphael. And the, he describes three paintings that left a very strong impression upon him in, uh, in those museums. The previous Rebbe describes the paintings in great detail. One of the paintings was a massive big canvas showing a war. And there was a big field on which two enemies were, were fighting. And in the higher uh, level, there were the, the um, generals looking through a, a um, telescope and watching the war. And he says that whole painting filled one with an awe and a fear. You saw the blood pouring down and, and the people are wounded with with legs and hands thrown off. And in one part of the painting, you see people who have sympathy are carrying three wounded soldiers and a doctor is walking with them. And suddenly a cannonball tears them to pieces. And one of the riders comes and is, is through the, uh, running towards them and his horse is blown up in the middle. All these um, descriptions of that painting is, is described by the Rebbe Rashab. And he said, one of the artists who began concentrating on the painting actually fainted. The second painting that he described is a beautiful field, a field with wheat and barley, and how it is now spring. The sky was so clear, and the sun was shining with all its strength. Uh, and he describes how the um, wheat and the barley 
was was flowing in the wind on one of the grains there was a little bird and there was a lizard lying in the sun the Rebbe Rashab says everyone who came to look at that painting was amazed at its accuracy and all the art experts just praise it to the heavens until one little simple farmer came and he said in Russian, he said, pravda. that means this painting is not 100% true. Everybody laughed at him and he said, you're a simple farmer. What do you understand about painting? You're talking about Raphael. He said, I don't care, Raphael, Shmafael. There is something not true about the painting. And to make it short, when they asked the farmer, what is he talking about? He said, do you see that bird on that grain? The grain is standing straight. When a bird fall, flies onto a grain, even though it's a light bird, it has to bend it to a certain degree. And everybody was amazed that even a simple person who sees an experience could know better than a master sculpture. And the third painting was about a Roman court case with the um, a, a, a whole long story. And the, Rebbe, uh, the previous Rebbe writes that the first painting you could get an imagery of how we have to fight against the evil inclination, the Yet Sahara, no matter what the costs are. From the second um, painting, we see the lesson that everything could be good, but when there is a certain sway, when there's a certain influence to towards something, you don't reach the truth. And the court case is that when a person is being judged by doing a favor for another Jew, that creates a defending angel and, and the pleasure becomes very great. Another story that they tell about his worldliness, I read somewhere, was that the Rebbe Rashab was, I think, in Germany. He was staying somewhere, and across the street of him was an orchestra um, practicing, rehearsing for a certain concert. And it was amazing how they were rehearsing. And the Rebbe Rashab was listening to the whole thing, and when the her rehearsal was over, he had the conductor called over and he said to him, I noticed from the way the music was playing that you missed a certain high chord. You didn't reach it. And the conductor said, that is amazing that you discerned that. And you're quite right. When I am conducting, I am living the music and I'm reliving the whole thing. And that chord which I missed out, I couldn't reach because I can only reach it when I have the enthusiasm of the crowd behind me. There's a certain electrifying aspect when you're talking in front of people and not just in front of a computer, you know. And he said, because you noticed it, I would like you to be my guest in the concert tonight. Here are some tickets to attend. So the Rebbe said he would attend, but not in public. If they give him a private booth behind the curtain, he will attend. And that's what they did. And at that night, he did uh, reach, the conductor reached the level of, of, of uh, playing that note that was missed out, which is quite extraordinary when you think of 
of the genius that the Rebbe Rashab uh, had. And the, uh, another thing, as I mentioned last week, the Rebbe Rashab had tremendously close um, connections with, with the um, people who were very close uh, to him. And uh, with other people besides the Hasidim as well. And one of his connections was Reb Chaim Briska. And um, Reb Chaim Briska uh, decided to join the, the uh, Reb Rashab in his whatever he was trying to do. And um, one of the meetings was in uh, Brisk. Someone said to him that, uh, why are you joining with the head of Hasidim? Do you know how many Jews were misnagdim and were against the Hasidim? And the Rab Chaim Briska answered, Rab Chaim Soloveitchik. He said, we come from a very pure family. When Hasidim first came out, there were two types of misnagdim. There was one type of misnagdim that was looking for the truth. And they had the suspicions about the Hasidim. But as the decades came, passed by, and we saw they were the truth, we support them, we participate them, and we work with them. The second type of misnagid are those people who just look for excuses and lies and try and bring about mechloikas. He says you have to be very careful of the descendants of those who, who are just uh, people who bring mechloikas. And um, <coughs> on the 15th of Elul in 1897, two days after the previous Rebbe's wedding, so the previous Rebbe was then 17, he started Tomchei Tmimim Lubavitch. Now Tomchei Tmimim is different to any other yeshiva. There are many yeshivas that were around even at that time. The yeshivas were there to teach Torah. Not only that, but there were also not yeshivas, but different types of schools of learning that were with the Alter Rebbe, he made the Chadorim. There was something called Yishuvniks in the Rebbe Marash, but they were either for very elite people or devoted people who wanted to sit and learn and they would go to any shul and learn. They would have to also subsist on their own. The Rebbe Rashab wanted to make a special yeshiva that wouldn't only be about Torah learning, but would make a Jew not only into a learner Jew, but a Yiddish a God-fearing Jew, a person who would be able to devote himself to Torah and Aveda. And so for the first time ever, he brought into the schedule of, of the yeshiva, not only studying, but also chassidus, to teach the person to be a, a servant of God. And he wrote a, a booklet called Kuntras Eitz Chaim, in which he wants to teach the people of how to serve God Almighty. By the way, that Simchas Torah, and Simchas Torah a year later, they came to the seventh Hakafa, and he said that on Simchas Torah, the Rebbe Rashab said, I'm davening to the giver of the Torah that he should help the students of yeshiva. 
and he began saying, Kadosh v'noira hoishiyana. And then he began, he told them to sing. And after they sang, he said, Toimech temimim hoishiyana. And then he said, the yeshiva I established still doesn't have a name. And he took the name from those words of the Hakofis, Toimech Temimim. And he said that the name of the yeshiva will be Tomchei Temimim, because the purpose of the yeshiva is that they should become complete in every way. And al Mimer he wrote at that time for the Bachram, and he said was, and Mimer by the name of Kol HaYoytze LaMolchomis Beis David, of get Chrisis le Ishtoi. Any person, the Talmud says, any person who goes out to fight in the wars of King David has to write a divorce to his wife. In those days, the meaning was when you went to war again in King David's times, if a soldier didn't come back, they were afraid that his wife would be an aguna. So he wrote a divorce. And if he didn't come back, the divorce had gone into effect and she wouldn't be an aguna. But what the Rebbe said is that anybody who is coming to fight the war of King David, and the war of King David is being fought so that we can bring Mashiach closer and we could bring Mashiach now. And what is required of us to bring Mashiach is Kesef get Krisis le Ishto. You have to be ready to divorce. What does your wife mean? All your physical yearnings, all your physical wants, and all everything that is disturbing you in your life and is trying to take you away from the ultimate goal. To bring towards Mashiach. And this is what it's all about, he said. Tom Chetmimim is there, Nedois Lahoir. We are lamplighters. We have to light up the world. And our whole striving and all our life should be towards bringing Mashiach. And that was one of the goals and one of the strivings that the Rebbe Rashab started with. And obviously, it was followed on by his son, the previous Rebbe, and by our beloved Rebbe. And this is what we have to do. Everything we do, as the Rabbi Masinta often mentions, and works so hard towards, and that is what we are all about, is towards bringing uh, Mashiach. And one of the things that I'd like to point out that the Rebbe Rashab truly in, innovated and initiated. And, and I'll tell you the story behind it. In 1915, the Rebbe Rashab it was in the middle of the um, First World War and was also beginning the communist, well, all the uprising, it wasn't yet the communists, but it was beginning the uprising against the czar, and he had to leave Lubavitch. And he, when he left Lubavitch, he, he um, went to Rostov. And in Rostov, he bought what you could call a courtyard. I was privileged to be in Rostov, there was, there's a double story house. The Rebbe Rashab lived on the top story. Eventually they got rid of the person underneath and that became the re previous Rebbe's house. And then there's another building which contained the, the, the uh, different aspects. And there was also the mikveh of the Rebbe Rashab. Now, Chabad, after the fall of communism, they managed to go uh, to Rostov and buy that courtyard of the Rebbe Rashab. And today it is the, the head of Chabad headquarters in Rostov. Reb Chaim Danziger, 
the shliach there does amazing work. You could go onto the YouTube and visit the whole um, on on virtual visit of the Rebbe's house in Rostov. Now, the Rebbe Rashab had made a mikveh there. And in the 1970s, as I mentioned, there were many Hasidim who had been in Rostov with the Rebbe Rashab, they were still alive. And when they bought the for that whole courtyard, they knew there was a mikveh, but they couldn't find it. So certain Hasidim who were alive and had been in Rostov flew there and they pointed out everything in the buildings where the Rebbe Rasha passed away, where Zichidis room is. If you go there now, there's signs. And then they came into that other building and it was a kitchen. And they said under this floor was where the mikveh was. And they broke the floor and would you believe it? There was the mikveh with the original water that the Rebbe Rashab uh, went into. And today it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful mikveh. I was also privileged with this whole group of going to the mikveh. But what the Rebbe Rashab initiated is, he said there's a certain hiddah and more beauty to the mitzvah for there to be a bar al gabba bar. You know, a mikveh has two pits. One pit is the rainwater, and the other pit is the uh, fresh water that we go into that is changed. Normally, people have mikvehs where it's one pit next to each other, and they have this thing in the wall that you just take out. And the Rebbe Rashab uh, initiated that they should um, make the mikveh with bar al gabba bar, the pit on top, and many um, Chabad mikvehs, including, if I'm not mistaken, Rabbi Hertz in in uh, Santin, has this this uh, aspect of of the bar al gabba bar. Um, the Rebbe Rashab, as I said, was very sick, and he made his first will when he was quite quite young. When he was in Rostov, there was great danger and they wanted uh, to leave even to go to Israel. When his wife said, how can you leave to go to Israel? What is going to happen with all the Hasidim? He said that I will leave into the hands of my son, who was a very young boy at the time. But because of uh, him wanting to go to Israel, they had to make a passport. And so he sat for a passport picture. And that's actually the picture that we have of the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe today is taken from the passport picture that um, he made at that time. Because of all the revolutions that were going on, it never worked out and he was unable to, 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 to leave. As I mentioned last time, the Rebbe Rashab wrote and spoke great, great hemshachim, great mamorim. The previous Rebbe writes that there are 1,173 mamorim that are in the handwriting of the Rebbe Rashab. There are many more that are not in his handwriting. And um, the previous Rebbe writes that every year on the Rebbe Rashab's birthday, from when the previous Rebbe was 14 years old in 1894 until 1920, including that last year of the Rebbe's life, he would say a private mimer for the previous Rebbe. And he works out that there are 27 years. And you know that every Jewish date can only fall out on four times of the week, four days of the week. So he says that the 20th of Cheshvan 
in those 27 years, on Monday, it came out seven times, on Tuesday, four times, on Thursday, nine times, on Shabbos, seven times. You see how the previous Rebbe was so into everything that the um, Rebbe was doing. I'd like to, to the, I don't have enough time to finish everything tonight, but I'd like to, to, to tell you firstly a, a story, then about Ashkafta the Rebbe, and then a final story. One of the beautiful stories that happened with the Rebbe Rashab and is such an important lesson to all of us is that he had a famous chosid, Rabbi Monia Monison was a diamond merchant. And once the Rebbe Rashab was sitting with Rabbi Monia and he was speaking about the praise of certain simple people. And Rabbi Monia said, Rebbe, why are you praising those people to such greatness? They are not learned, they are not holy. There's nothing special that I could see in them. I mean, we have, you have many Hasidim and many people who are much holier. Why don't you praise those others? I can't see what you see in them. The Rebbe Rashab didn't answer that, that question, but towards the end of the audience, the Rebbe Rashab asked him, tell me, Rabmonia, he was a diamond merchant. And he said to him, do you have your diamonds with you? And he said, yes, they're in my safe. He brought the diamonds and he spewed them out. You know, you show them on some black shmata. He shows them to the Rebbe. And the Rebbe says to him, tell me, is there any diamond here that is spectacular? Rabmania picks up one of the diamonds, shows it to the Rebbe. And he says, you see this diamond? This one. Is, is unbelievable. It's worth maybe more than five, five times more than any other diamond in the pouch. The Rebbe looks at it, holds it up to the light. Then he picks up some other diamonds. Some were bigger, some were shinier. And he turns to Rabmania and he says, Ich verstehe nicht. What makes this diamond so much better than the others? There are many diamonds that I, I would pay a lot more for. And Reb Monia kind of gives the Rebbe a smile and he says, Rebbe, with all due respect, when it comes to brillianten, when it comes to diamonds, you cannot look at them with a naked eye and think you know what you're looking at. Diamonds take years of study and then you have to be an expert. And the Rebbe gave him the same smile and said that Monia, when when it comes to Jewish souls, you cannot just look at them with a naked eye and think you know what you're looking at. People take years of study. Then you have to be an expert to really know. The Rebbe, <coughs> the previous Rebbe also writes from the Rebbe Rashab <coughs> that how holy you are, a Rebbe doesn't come by himself. A Rebbe is a special soul sent down. Now there's a famous book called Ashkafta the Rebbe, which is written by a person I knew in fact, well, I didn't know him personally, but I met, remember him in New York. His name was Reb Dov. Rifkin, and he was present when the Rebbe Rashab passed away. And he tells about the miraculous time. He, the, uh, two weeks before the Rebbe Rashab passed away on Purim. And that Purim, you have to understand what is going on. Every Rebbe had a unique challenge in life. Not only uh, their own, but the circumstances of the world that they were living in, which made an impact. Now, in 1920, it was already added within the communism, and 
the people were so scared of what was happening at that time. There were curfews and it was forbidden for anyone to be in the street after 9 p.m. You were not allowed to congregate. You were not allowed to, to have a l'chaim. You were not allowed to sing and everything. And the Rebbe Rashab had told everyone not to come to his courtyard in Rostov. But on Purim, they said <coughs> they, are, they have to go. So one by one, they came into the Rebbe Rashab. And suddenly, the Rebbe Rashab changed. And he said, I am not afraid of them. And even the previous Rebbe was afraid and his wife was very afraid. And he said, we don't have to be afraid. Let us sing loud. And this was crazy. And he said to his son, don't worry. We have nothing to be afraid of. They are nothing to us. And he then sent, he gave, took out a lot of money and he gave it to buy uh, mashke, to buy vodka. And they said they had looked in the city, but there's nothing to buy. He said, I don't believe it. In Russia, everything exists. And they went out to, to find it. He also made a collection and there was plates of money on the table, which also was forbidden. And during that time, the police came to investigate. Everybody needed to have the proper papers. They were congregating more, many more people than were allowed. They didn't have the papers. There was vodka there. There was money on the table. All these things can have you shot immediately. The police came to the gate. Some people went out. They said they want to investigate. They said, sorry, the Rebbe is busy now. It was unheard of. They just left. No one could believe it. They came back a few hours later and they came into the room where the Rebbe Rashab was. And he said, he's not afraid of them. He said, a mimer. The mimer was Reishis Goyim Amolek, how all of Klippa is nothing. And they just left. All the people saw the great miracles that had happened at that time. Uh, as I say, I'm getting to the end of my, the time that I um, am allotted, but um, there's a long story and many, many lessons uh, uh, that we learn from the Rebbe Rashab in his passing day. Before he passed away, he said, Ich gei in Himmel und ksovim lozich eich which means I am going to heaven, but my writings I'm leaving for you. And that was the Mamorim. And he passed away on the 2nd of Nisan, a hundred years ago in 1920. May what he wanted to accomplish be accomplished, that we should truly And now I'd like to conclude Rabbi Kalibis, story, before, you conclude with, before you conclude with your story, did yeah. they move? Did they move the Rebbe Rashab's uh, grave? Yes. yes. Why don't you yes. just tell that story? What happened? Yes. In uh, 1920, they buried him in a certain uh, grave, obviously. And in the 40s, the uh, Russian government decided to build a sports stadium on top of that cemetery. So they wrote to the um, previous Rebbe and the previous Rebbe instructed them to move his grave as well as a Rabbi Gerari. It's a whole long story who is buried next to him. And in the middle of the night with great, great sacrifice, they uh, went to dig up his grave site. And what they found was even though the Rebbe Rashab had been buried over 20 years earlier, 
his body was mamish complete, still with even like a shine to it, as if he had just been put in. And today, when you visit the Rebbe Rashab's grave site, which you can, and you can see it also, as I say, on the YouTube, you can have a whole tour of it. That is not where he was originally buried, but where his body had been exhumed to. Is that what you're referring to, Rabbi? That's exactly what I was referring to, yeah. Okay. Now, I'd like to tell you, to, to conclude in uh, Daron's honor, a story of a Yid that we, we had the privilege of knowing. There was a chosid by the name of Rableza Nanes. Rableza Nanes wrote a famous book called Subota. Subota means Shabbos in Russian, and it's a whole book about him going to Siberia and how he had self-sacrifice for, for Shabbos and how his life was saved in the most miraculous way. When we were Bochrim in Morristown, New Jersey, that was in 1972 and 73, the uh, Russia just opened up and many Hasidim came out of Russia that time, and you could see the Paris, the fruit of the Rebbe Rashab in setting up Tom Chitmimim, how these Hasidim <coughs> were able to cleave and stick to Yiddishkeit. It wasn't just learning Gemara, as other yeshivas had. It was the study of Hasidus and, and davening Bikavona be, and all that which the Rebbe's put into them that helped them to survive and remain Jewish. So when we were in Morristown, many of them came out. In fact, I had fellow students, the Zaltzmans, the Nautics, and others who had come out of Russia at that time. And some of the elder Hasidim who came out of Russia came to Morristown to Fabreng with us. And one of them was Rableza Nanes. What a tzir, what an image of a chassid. So this is a story that Rableza Nanis tells. That when he was 17 years old, he was with the Rebbe and he had to travel back. And he was very afraid because the trains were extremely dangerous. This was in the year 1919 that was already post World War I, but in the middle of the revolution. It was very dangerous. So he came to the Rebbe Rashab and he was crying. He said, what, I need a bracha from you. What am I going to do traveling all alone on this train? So the Rebbe said to him, what do you mean all alone? It says, Meloi kol ha'aretz kevaydoi. God is with you wherever you go. You're never alone. God helps you and God will look after you. The Rebbe, so Rebbe said, but there are Cossacks. The Cossacks are very terrible anti-Semites and they could kill me. So I'm scared. The Rebbe Rashab said, you have nothing to be afraid of. God fills the whole world with his glory, even against the Cossacks. And so, what can you do? He went onto the train and not wanting to be where everyone else was, he managed to get a first class ticket. And when he went on to the carriage of first class, he saw it wasn't going to help. The carriage was full of Cossacks and anti-Semites, terrible. But what could you do? He sat down amongst them. And although the train ride originally should have taken 18 hours, he says, because of all the turmoil that was going on at that time in 1919, it took 72 hours for that train ride. And it was horrific. The next morning, he woke up very early because he knew he could be in danger. 
in davening, he took out his talis and tefillin and began davening. While he was davening um, in his talis and tefillin, a Cossack woke up and was watching him. He then took out a big bottle of vodka. He drank half the bottle and then he shared the other half amongst his friends. And then he tells his friends, can you believe the chutzpah of this Jew? He comes onto our train. He knows what we feel about Jews and about Judaism and everything. And he has the chutzpah to put on talis and tefillin. I'm going to kill him. He takes out a gun and he says, you see this gun? There's nine marks on it. Each mark stands for a Jew that I murdered. I killed nine Jews, and I'm proud to say, with this one, I'm going to kill the 10th Jew, and I'll get great reward up above once I do that. So he is already the blazers looking out, saying Shema, he can't understand what's happening. Uh, he knows the Rebbe gave him a bracha. And suddenly, one of the Cossacks stands up and he says, you know, ammunition is quite precious today. We don't have an unlimited amount. Why do you want to waste your bullet on that Jew? We, the train is going up a high mountain now. Why don't we wait till we get to the top of the mountain? Then we open the Jew and fling him out. And we could watch as he gets shattered down the mountain and ripped to shreds. And we can enjoy watching this Jew die instead of just wasting a bullet on him. <laughs> can you imagine what this Rebleza Nanis felt like. And he was, as I say, expecting the worst, but he knew that the Rebbe had promised him, God is with me. And he's waiting to see where is this miracle going to come from. They're heading up, and as they're getting close to the top of the mountain, a senior Cossack who is missing a foot gets up and he says, listen here, my fellow Cossacks, I want to share something with you. He says, I want to tell you, I live near the city of Rostov. And there I could tell you, I see thousands of Jews who are Hasidim, who listen and obey their Rebbe. Do you know? We are fighting the communists. We hate the communists. And the communists hate us, the Cossacks. But even more than the communists hate the Cossacks, they hate the Jews, especially the Hasidim. And if you kill this Jew, you will be making the communists happy and will be doing their job. Please. Let's not help the communists. Let's not make them happy. Let this Jew be and leave him alive. And so they did. And so the blaze and tells. There he saw the fulfillment of the Rebbe's bracha. That Hashem is truly meloi koloretz kevaydoi. Hashem is truly filling the whole world, even against the communists. And this is what we should all appreciate today as well. No matter what challenges any person is facing, the world is full with God's glory. He has his reasons. And let us truly become the warriors of the house of David, fighting for Mashiach's coming. And once he comes, we will see the realization of all the brachas and the answers 
of all the challenges we went through. A good fach. Thank you all for participating and for listening this evening. May the Rebbe's schossen stand by us all. Good work. Thank you, Rabbi Kalabach. Um, we you. truly appreciate it. And to everyone who joined, thank you. Please see tomorrow's webinars. Have a great evening.